dragons, powerful, regal, and terrifying. They are one of the most common creatures to appear in myths, legends, and fairy tales. In the modern day, they are firmly established as fictional, but in the not-so-distant past, dragons were viewed as true flesh-and-blood animals. Although the time that dragons first appear in myths is not known for sure, their first recorded appearances can be traced back as far as approximately 4000 BC. Stories of dragons appear all throughout history, and almost every culture around the world has their own idea about dragons and their nature. There are stories about dragons on every continent of the world, and they have left an undeniable impact on cultures around the world to this very day. Hello, and welcome to Unknown History. In this documentary, we will cover the fascinating history of dragons, starting with their origins and descriptions and cultures around the world. We will then examine some likely real-life creatures and phenomena that could have inspired the dragon myth and belief in their existence. And finally, examine how the legacy of this dragon mythos has impacted our modern culture to this day. For this documentary's purposes, we first need to define what exactly a dragon is. The modern-day dragon is usually thought to have wings and breathe fire. They are also said to have scales and claws. Some also may have horns. Almost always they are also said to be venomous. Some dragons may have two or more heads. They may also have more than one tail. They may have two, four, or even more legs. However, they are most commonly said to have four legs. These dragons are said to eat things such as wild game, livestock, and even humans, especially children. There are many definitions and variations of creatures that were called dragons in the past that may be classified into different categories today, such as wyverns, worms, drakes, and sea serpents, to name a few. For this documentary's purposes, we will consider all of these creatures as a type of dragon, as in the past, a dragon was generally considered to be any large and powerful serpentine creature. Dragons in the past were said to be able to live almost anywhere, depending on the type of dragon mentioned. Their habitats range from the center of the earth to the middle of the ocean. They are most commonly said to be found in caves, mountains, or anywhere dark and damp where people could not venture. The exact origins of the dragon is impossible to determine. However, the earliest possible recorded records of dragon-like creatures exist in the cultures of early Mesopotamia. These dragon-like creatures took many features from other animals, such as lions, snakes, and eagles. These Mesopotamian dragons were considered sacred and extremely powerful, and often were depicted guarding places such as temples and tombs. Tiamat, a creation goddess in Sumerian mythology, was sometimes depicted as a dragon queen or mother, implying that all serpents and dragons of the world originated from her. Another candidate for the earliest recording of a dragon-like creature is the Leviathan in the Hebrew Bible. This passage from Job describes the Leviathan, which has many features that we would now associate with dragons. I will not fail to speak of the Leviathan's limbs, its strength, and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? Who dares open the doors of its mouth and ringed with fearsome teeth? Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together, each is so close to the next that no air can pass between them. They are joined fast to one another and cling together and cannot be parted. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from its mouth. Many of the earliest descriptions of dragons come from ancient religious texts and tales around the world. In ancient Egypt, there was the serpent god Apep, who is depicted as a giant snake or sometimes a crocodile. Apep was the champion of darkness and chaos, and thus was in conflict with the chief Egyptian god Ra, god of the sun. The story goes that every day Apep would lie in wait just below the horizon, as Ra flew across the sky, providing sunlight to the world. Once Ra would reach the horizon, Apep would attempt to devour him, causing the night to occur. Ra would then defeat Apep thanks to the faithful Egyptians' offerings and prayers, and would return to the sky, ending the night and bringing the new light of dawn. The cycle is said to repeat for all of time, and was the ancient Egyptians' explanation for day and night. In ancient India, there is the story of Vitra in the Rikt Veda. Vitra means the enveloper, and was said to be a giant serpent that held the world's waters captive until he was killed by the hero Indra. India also has tales of the Naka, a serpentine dragon-like creature that is common to all cultures influenced by Hinduism. Naga are often cloaked like a mongoose and may have several heads depending on their rank. 
They usually have no arms or legs, but those with limbs resemble the eastern dragon. Many of the Naga are inclined towards larger snakes than traditional dragons. Naga are depicted commonly throughout India as well as in cultures like the Khmer and in Indonesia, who are heavily influenced by Hinduism. In ancient Norse mythology, there is the famous dragon or sea serpent Jormungur, which translates as huge monster or serpent in Old Norse. The dragon grew so large that it was able to surround the earth and grasp its own tail in its mouth. As a result, it received the name of World Serpent. Jormungur's archenemy is the thunder god Thor. The most famous story involving Jormungur is when Thor encounters him while fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, Thor strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use his bait. They then row to a point where Hymir often sat and caught fish and then drew up two whales. Thor demands to go further out to sea and does this despite Hymir's protest. Thor then prepares a strong line and a large hook and baits it with the ox's head, which Jormungur bites. Thor then pulls the serpent from the water and the two face off against one another. Jormungur dribbling in poison and blood causes Hymir to go pale with fear. As Thor grabs his hammer to kill the serpent, the giant cuts the line, leaving the serpent to sink beneath the waves and return to its original position encircling the earth. It is said when Jormungur releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin and the world will end. The dragon was a creature that was feared and revered in Norse culture. Their Viking longships, also called Draknar, or dragon ships, were used to transport Viking warriors on their raids across Europe. Often seagoing dragon ships would have a dragon head mounted at its stern to ward off sea serpents and evil spirits. In ancient Mexico, Quetzalcoatl is a Mesoamerican deity whose name comes from the Nahuatl language and has the meaning of feathered serpent and is depicted in Aztec culture as a giant feathered dragon god. The Aztecs were this dragon god's most famous patrons. The worship of Quetzalcoatl was ubiquitous and the Aztec ruled Mexico and the Aztecs built the world's largest pyramid at Tenochtitlan dedicated to his worship which often included bloodletting and human sacrifice in order to appease him. Dragons even appear in the myths and legends of the Pacific Island peoples. In the Maori mythology of New Zealand, the Tanifa, a dragon-like being that lives in deep pools or rivers, dark caves, or in the sea, especially in places with dangerous currents or deceptive breaker waves. The Tanifa are considered highly respective and protective guardians of the people in some places, and in some other traditions as dangerous predatory beings. In their role as guardians, the Tanifa were vigilant to ensure that the people were respecting the restrictions imposed by the Tapu. They made certain that any of the violations of the Tapu were punished. The Tanifa were especially dangerous to people from other tribes. There are many legends of battles with Tanifa, both on land and at sea. Often these conflicts took place soon after the settlement of New Zealand generally after a Tanifa had attacked and eaten a person from a tribe that had no connection with it. In the mythology of Hawaii, the Mo'o are water dragons said to possess profound powers. They are omniscient and can manipulate the weather. Even their disembodied tongues and tails have potent power. The more vicious among the Mo'o have been known to summon giant waves to sweep trespassers from trails or drown victims in pits of poisonous water. Not all of the Mo'o are malevolent, but many are beloved protectors who lend their aid to their devotees. At one time in ancient Hawaii, fish ponds and pools throughout Hawaii had stone markers signifying their resident Mo'o. Ancient Hawaiians believed that if a Mo'o guardian received proper offerings, it would respond in a manner ensuring fat harvest and a healthy stream flow. But if it were neglected, it would wreak havoc on the area. It is likely that the Egyptian and Mesopotamian tales of dragons would ultimately influence the Greeks in their own mythology. Dragons appear in many times in Greek mythology. Zeus himself overcame the dragon Typhon, who is described as a many-headed, fire-breathing serpent. Their battle is said to have shook the earth, but Zeus ultimately defeated Typhon with his thunderbolts. The hero Hercules was sent to kill a child of Typhon, the Hydra, and Apollo, the son of Zeus, is said to have slain a dragon with a bow and arrow when he was only four. In the epic Jason and the Argonauts, the hero sought a golden fleece which was guarded by a fierce dragon. This is important as it shows an example of a common theme that occurs in many dragon myths 
which is that they are often guarding something valuable, such as treasure. The word dragon actually comes from ancient Greek and the word draktona, which means to watch, suggesting that the beasts guard treasure such as mountains of gold, coins, or gems. The Romans would continue the dragon myths. The Romans do not have many dragon stories that are unique to them. Their dragons were mostly based on stories from Greek mythology that they then expanded on and changed the names to Roman names. One story about a dragon that is unique to the Romans is about a mud dragon outside of a prominent Roman city. A dragon is said to have made its lair in the mud pits. For centuries, the dragon protected the city, destroying any enemy that attacked. The dragon demanded a high price for this act as the city's guardian. Every month, the city had to perform a ritual that ended with a virgin bringing a basket of food to the dragon in his mud cave. The girl had to hand feed the dragon, and if her purity was flagged or she showed any fear while feeding him, he ate her. If she did not flinch, the dragon would return her to the city unharmed. Roman naturalist Philony the Elder wrote about dragons in his encyclopedia Naturalis Historia. In Book 8, he talks about reptiles such as the crocodile and serpent, ruling these out as possibilities for being the dragon. He writes about dragons a few times. First, he writes about a dragon that intertwined around an elephant and crushed it. But then when the elephant collapsed, it crushed the dragon as well. Dragons, now wary of being crushed, entangle elephants' feet and legs with their tails. The elephant, however, untangles the dragon's tail with its trunk. The book states the main reason the dragon bothers with this is so it can suck the elephant's blood while it's distracted. He says that in Ethiopia, dragons are bred to be 30 feet long, although in India, there are dragons that are so big that they can swallow whole stags or bulls whole. The generals of Rome often used dragons as an excuse for not completing their missions. One general took this excuse a step further by sending a dragon hide back to Rome as proof of his army encountering the beast. In the 3rd century BC, General Attilus Regulus was in North Africa battling Carthage. At the Bergata River, a dragon attacked his army, according to the report. The dragon had crept up and situated itself behind the Roman army's wall. General Regulus ordered his men to kill it, which they did. The reported battle with the dragon was fierce. The dragon took many soldiers to kill it. Many soldiers were taken down by the dragon's vicious mouth, and many others were crushed by its huge tail. Its hide was too thick for their weapons to penetrate and so they had to start using siege weapons to crush it with heavy stones. It is then said that the army skinned the creature and sent its skin back to the Roman Senate. The Senate then measured the skin, and it was said to have been 120 feet in length. It is then said that the hide was on display in Rome for a 100 years. During the 2nd century AD, the Roman cavalry adopted the Draco as their military standard. It took the form of a large dragon on the end of a lance with a slivered, gaping jaws with the rest of the body made of colored silk. The jaws faced the wind so the silky body could inane and ripple in the air. The Romans first used it during the Hippica Gymnasia, their cavalry games. These cavalry games were glamorous training exercises that were performed in decorated armor. The Draco was used as a target for the opposing team to hit to score points. From these games, the Draco was then adopted as a normal military standard and was used as a standard until the fall of the Empire in 476 AD. Roman dragons combine the serpentine Greek dragons with the dragons of the Near East to give us a dragon that is closer to what we imagine the European dragons of today, with a long body, four clawed feet, and crests upon their head. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the idea of the Roman dragon would ultimately be absorbed and slightly modified by the Celtic, Germanic, and Frankish peoples of Europe, who had tales of dragons who were fire-breathing and usually are found in caves or mountains guarding treasure. These dragons are said to have great wings, sharp claws, and can breathe fire and poison to defend themselves from intruders looking to steal their treasure. This is where the typical western dragon of today originates. The most famous dragon legend in the western world is the Anglo-Saxon epic poem Beowulf, which comes from the post-Roman period. After some of its treasure was stolen by a man, the dragon went on a rampage in the country of Geats, where Beowulf is king. Beowulf, though an old man, set out to kill the monster, with the help of his companion Wiggolf. The dragon was slayed, but Beowulf was mortally wounded in the process. Another popular tale of dragons from this time period is the saga of Volsungs. In this tale, a hero named Sigurd hears of the dragon Fafnir, who is guarding a hoard of treasure. 
To defeat Fafnir, Sigurd, instead of confronting the dragon directly, hides in a crevice of the cave and waits for Fafnir to walk above him, where he then stabs it through the stomach and kills him, and takes the treasure for himself. Many stories of heroes defeating dragons and taking their treasure would arise throughout Europe. At this time, tales of dragons in Eastern Europe were also becoming more common and often had heroes outsmarting the dragon with wit. The Yellow Dragon is an Egyptian tale about a cowardly dragon. In this story, a poor old man set out to find a honey cake. He fell asleep, and when he awoke, the cake was covered with flies. He killed the hundred flies with one block of wood and wrote, I killed a hundred with a stroke. At this time, a cowardly yellow dragon passed by and saw the words. The old man, perceiving the dragon's fear, tricked the dragon into thinking he was the strongest man on earth. By tricking the dragon, he earned a huge sack of gold to support his family. Another famous story of a dragon in Eastern Europe is the dragon of Wawel Hill in Poland. According to legend, a dragon lived underneath Wawel Hill and demanded cattle every week from a nearby village. If the dragon did not receive the number of cattle it wanted, it would eat a villager instead. The king of the region, seeing this, sent his two sons to kill the dragon. Knowing they could not defeat the dragon in open combat, they got a cowskin and dosed it in burning sulfur before offering it to the dragon. When the dragon consumed the sulfur-coated cowskin, it was killed. These western dragons of Europe are far different from the other popular archetype of a dragon, which is dominated in the far eastern countries of the world, such as China, Korea, Tibet, and Japan. These eastern dragons, sometimes called Long or Long, may almost seem like a completely different creature than the western dragon. Their anatomy, their behavior, their symbolism, and what they mean to society are quite different. The East seems to value dragons for their magic and beauty. They were held with high respect from the people in the East. However, this view is drastically changed in the West, where dragons were viewed primarily as monsters and antagonists. Western dragons have traditionally been a symbol of evil. A typical Western dragon can fly and breathe fire. Many legends describe dragons as greedy, keeping hordes of gold and other precious treasures for themselves. In the West's myths and folklore, dragons were monsters to be conquered, as dragons may have been seen to represent the dark side of humanity, including greed, lust, and violence. The conquest of a dragon represents the confrontation and extinguishment of those evil instincts. With the introduction of Christianity to Europe, dragons would also become a symbol for paganism and the devil as well. This is quite the contrast to in the East, where dragons were used in ceremonies and parades. This creature, like the western dragons, can sometimes also take the form of a monster. However, it is made of many different animal qualities and parts, and it symbolizes heroism and not as much of a danger or threat in the eastern stories. The eastern dragon is seen more as a protector than a villain. It is a symbol of power and beauty. The Chinese even have a year of the dragon, and it is said that anyone born in this year will be healthy, wealthy, wise, and of all things which the dragon of the east represents. The year of the dragon is also said to be a very prosperous year for the people of China. Some Chinese legends even claim that the Chinese people in fact themselves are descendants of dragons, and that the first emperor of China was in fact a dragon himself. Because the East holds dragons in such a great respect, there are many tales about dragons and wealth that they bring to the people. One story is about a dragon's pearl. Many stories involve dragons protecting riches, but in this story it is only a single pearl. It is said that a poor boy found a dragon's pearl that multiplied everything that it touched. When they put it in their rice dish one night, the next morning it was full of rice. But when a robber came to steal this pearl, the young boy quickly swallowed it. The story then goes that the boy was turned into a dragon himself. While this eastern story is about the good of turning into a magical dragon, the west has a story of punishment that leaves a man as a dragon. In this story, a prince kills his father for his fame and fortune. Because of this, the dying king puts a curse on his son that he will become a dragon. Later in this life, the dragon is killed by another of his greedy brothers, who then receives the curse and becomes a dragon as well. Very little seems to be the same between the dragons of the east and the dragons of the west. Even the dragon's habitats change between the two cultures. Eastern dragons almost always live in some sort of damp place like a lake or the ocean. Western dragons are the ones who are said to be able to live in deserts, mountains, caves, the ocean, or even in fire. Essentially anywhere that is unknown and not safe for man. Ultimately, the most famous and well-known versions of dragons would come from the West. 
thanks to Christianity and its focus on the stories of pious and heroic knights defeating dragons in order to save pagan villages and bring them to the cross. The dragon was often used as a symbol of paganism across Europe, and they were seen to represent the dark sides of humanity, including greed, lust for power, and violence. This made stories of Christian knights defeating them extremely popular in the highly religious medieval Europe and ultimately it would be the basis for the classic tales of knights going on quests to vanquish evil dragons. The most influential of all these tales is the English legend St. George and the Dragon. As the story goes, a dragon lived in a lake near a city. To prevent it from destroying the city, locals would appease it by giving it offerings. First it began with sheep, then men, and finally their children, which were chosen by lottery system. Eventually, the lottery fell on the king's daughter. The king offered all of his gold to the people to spare her, but they would not accept, as the dragon still required an offering. With a heavy heart, the king sent his daughter, the princess, out to the lake, but at the same time by chance, St. George was passing by, and as the dragon emerged from the lake, George charged it on horseback with his lance, severely wounding the dragon. He then bounded the dragon in a collar and with the princess headed back to the city. The people of the city were terrified of the dragon, and George agreed to slay the dragon if the people would convert to Christianity and be baptized. The king and his people agreed, and so George cut off the dragon's head. It is said that a church was founded on top of the dragon's remains, and that the spring flowing from the altar would cure all diseases. For this deed is one of the reasons that George was granted sainthood, and indeed to this day, St. George is the patron saint of England. This legend is likely the origin of the classic knight rescuing a princess and slaying a dragon fairy tale. The French have a similar tale of St. Martha and the dragon. In this tale, a dragon named Tarasque has been terrorizing the small town of Nerlucht, situated near the Rhine River. The town had made many attempts to slay the dragon, but to no avail. Finally, they called upon the Holy Lady Martha in the town of Santa Marie de la Mer. Martha bravely tamed the beast and led it back to the town, where it was killed as punishment for its wickedness. The town then changed its name to Tarscon to honor Martha's deed. Tales and reports of encounters with dragons would continue all throughout the medieval period and up and through the Renaissance period. One type of dragon, or sea serpent, was still feared back in the time of Christopher Columbus. During this time when the world was thought to be flat, these dragons were said to be at the edge of the earth waiting to eat anyone who dared to sail that far off into the ocean. These stories kept many people from exploring further into the world. Maps were even made marking the places where dragons lived. At the edge of maps, the words, Here be dragons, was almost always printed. At this point in history, dragon sightings would continue at a lesser rate, and they were typically relegated as beings living in many of the world's most uninhabitable and far-off places and dragons were not regarded as a real threat to everyday life. Despite this, a large majority of the Western world's population still believed that dragons were real flesh and blood animals at the time. However, as the advances of the scientific revolution and the Age of Enlightenment occurred in the West in the 1700s and 1800s, Europeans started to explore all of the far-flung regions of the world, and science was getting increasingly better at cataloging and recording species of animals. The dragon, however, remained elusive despite their massive size. This lack of sightings, and with few places left to hide, meant the dragon in the scientific community and then the general public's mind became relegated like many mythical creatures to the realm of myth and fantasy, where it has remained firmly till this day. As now in a modern age of photography, DNA evidence, and 24-hour surveillance, a giant fire-breathing lizard has nowhere to remain undetected. Even if the dragon is not a real animal, this still leaves the question of what inspired our ancestors from cultures all around the world to have so many tales, myths, poems, pieces of artwork, and so on, of what can be described as dragon-like creatures. Ultimately, it is impossible to truly know what inspired the creation of the dragon. However, we can make some educated guesses. The first and most obvious place to look and see is what known animals could closely match the descriptions of a dragon. In dragon myths, especially more ancient accounts, dragons strongly resemble snakes. Snakes are one of the most commonly feared animals among humans along with spiders. The world in almost all locations, especially in the tropics, is full of large species of snakes such as pythons and cobras. If a story about one of these animals was told to a second-hand source and with some details embellished, 
it is easily understandable how this could have turned into an inspiration for an early dragon myth. Eels are also a likely source for many of the sea serpent myths, as they can grow to huge sizes and resemble snakes. Another prime suspect for the origin of the dragon is the species of crocodile throughout the world, as these animals can grow to massive sizes and are some of the most dangerous ambush predators on earth. Even the Leviathan passage from the Bible strongly resembles the description of a crocodile as it describes the beast's armor plates on its back, mouthful of teeth, and glowing eyes. One can also not forget to mention the Komodo dragon, which indeed has the word dragon in its name, and undoubtedly could have fueled the imaginations of people who had heard of the giant lizards on the Komodo Islands. Considering how these animals would have been described to someone who had never encountered one, it is not difficult to see how the early origins of the dragon may have begun. Another important factor in the creation of the dragon myth, and a likely long-held belief in dragons throughout the world, is the fossils of dinosaurs. In China, dinosaur bones were used for centuries in Chinese medicine as dragon bones, and undoubtedly, if any ancient miners uncovered fossilized remains of dinosaurs, it would be quite understandable for them to mistake them as bones of dragons. In fact, even into the early modern era, many bones of various creatures or fossils were combined to try to create fake skeletons of dragons. The combination of the factors of real-life animals and fossils and the human imagination allowed for dragons to appear in many cultures throughout the world, and as in Europe, eventually borrow and combine details which ultimately led to the dragons that people heard stories about but never saw. This combined with the normal practice of the time of blaming things such as dragons as an explanation for why people went missing in dangerous places or why certain areas on maps were undiscovered or as the Roman generals explained, why their military campaigns failed. This allowed for dragons to serve as a sort of gatekeeper and scapegoat for why the world is so scary and mysterious, and allowed them to remain real in many people's minds for thousands of years, until humanity was able to explore the whole world and see that there were truly no dragons after all. Despite not being a real animal, it was not the end for the dragon. Far from it. It is likely that the dragon is more popular and well-known today than at any other point in human history. The dragon is often described as the emblem of fantasy. This is thanks to Western fantasy novels that started to revive many of Europe's old myths during the late 19th and early 20th century. It was in J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, that the most famous dragon in modern history, Smaug, would appear. Smaug is a dragon almost pulled straight out of European myths, such as Beowulf or the tale of St. George and the Dragon. He is a massive, ancient, winged, intelligent, greedy, and vengeful dragon that showers his foes in walls of flame shot from his mouth. Dragons would also become a key part of the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons, and would introduce many variations of the classical Western dragon. At this point, dragons were an integral part of Western fantasy, and their influence would only increase in the decades to come. In the East, dragons till this day are still revered symbols and an iconic part of cultures in countries like China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. A Chinese New Year, the most important holiday in the Chinese culture, is dominated by dragon floats and images. In the modern-day Western world, the dragon is currently also at an all-time popularity, with dragons making appearances in media of all kinds, from children, TV shows, artwork, video games, and movies, to name a few places. The dragon is indeed more recognizable by the average person than many real animals such as sloths, otters, or monitor lizards. This shows how permanent a part of Western culture and modern culture the dragon has truly become. In summation, the dragon is a fascinating magical creature that has captivated our attention for thousands of years. The many different kinds of dragons and the ability for us to use our imagination to create these creatures only adds to their appeal. With many stories that have been told about these great beings, it seems that dragons have become a permanent part of our mythical history. Whether these creatures are or ever were real in the end doesn't matter, as they are now the flagship for what human imagination can create and the legacy of the dragon will live on in our stories and art for generations to come. Thank you for watching my documentary on the history of dragons. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and check out my other videos, and subscribe for more interesting and unique history documentaries.